Coach, nine of the 11 games this weekend that involved an ACC school were decided by single digits. Seven of the 11 were decided by five points or less. There have just been so many of those type of games this year that are coming down to the final minute. Well, Jones, I think uh, if you think of it this way, within 30 seconds, every game we played in the ACC, That's right. the outcome of the game is in doubt in the last 30 seconds. Yep. Now you can say, well, Georgia Tech was a five-point win. Well, they had to go to the monitor to take the ball away from us, That's right. which I didn't agree with the call. Uh, but they take the ball, they could take it and go to the monitor, and then it's their ball instead of our ball with – it was inside 30 seconds, down three. And now all of a sudden, that's a huge difference. It's their ball. We fouled them, and so now it's a five-point game. North Carolina State, we had the last two shots of the game that uh, could have tied the game. Mm-hmm. Notre Dame and uh, uh, Miami goes down, and we went on last-second shot in Miami and with nine seconds to go against Notre Dame. It has been that type of year for Carolina and just in the ACC thus far. So many weird aspects to this season, and you're seeing that play out on the court as well. We're going to talk a little bit more about this Miami game, just some of the individual standouts. Plus, we're going to get to your questions for Coach coming up soon as well. It's the Roy Williams Show from Learfield IMG College. Back with the Hall of Fame head coach of the Tar Heels, Roy Williams. My name is Jones Angel. Thanks so much for joining us here on the Roy Williams Show. Talking a little bit about Carolina's only action last week, the victory over Miami. That was Tuesday night down in Coral Gables. And Coach mentioned Leaky Black and just a terrific game in total for Leaky. Career high, 16 points. He was 4-4 four of four from three, nine rebounds, three assists, two steals, a block. Really uh, gave you a whole lot on the court on Tuesday night. Yeah, and, you know, Leaky went down during the game, yeah. hurt his ankle and, and fought through it and uh, made big plays. Goes to the free throw line and misses both free throws. And then the very next possession, he gets a wide open three, and he took his time and checked the wind and the whole bit, but knocked it in <laughs> for us. And uh, uh, you're exactly right, four four from the three point line. I think that's the most he's ever made in a game. I'm not sure he's ever made more than two in a game. Right. Uh, but uh, uh, he gave us a lift, and so far it's been something that uh, we've needed every game. Somebody stepped up, and uh, uh, we'd like for all of them to keep trying to have take that opportunity and take turns doing it. Had a chance to talk to Leakey before the season started, and he talked a lot about how hard he had been working on his shot. And he understood that was something that needed to get more consistent. He felt like it was getting there. G- good to see him ha- start to have some success because, uh, boy, he could become such a dangerous player with everything else that he does well. Yeah, if he gets his shot going in, he's because re- he could be and should be. And I say should be because I've been after him pretty hard this year. Right. He's had three games where he was as good defensive as anybody I've ever coached. And then he's had a couple of games. He's as bad as it. That's a big range. You don't need to have that range. So I've been pushing him to be the best defender in the league. On top of that, he can help us rebound. He can be that third point guard who can bring the ball up the court and get us in the offense, get us in the break. And at uh, Miami made the threes from outside. So if he gets his shot going, it just adds another dimension to a guy that can be a really, really, really good basketball player. Coach mentioned the rebounding. Leakey was going into the weekend top 20 in the ACC in rebounding total, having a career year in that regard as well. And speaking of rebounds, Coach, Dayron Sharp, 12 points and a season-high 16 rebounds. What What is Dayron – how is he able to be such an effective rebounder? Well, he's got to stop rebounding his own misses. <laughs> you know, go ahead and make it the first. I'd rather That's have right. a high field goal percentage and lower offensive rebounds. But uh, uh, he's – I said early in the season, you remember this, I'm sure, Jones, that he had a chance to be the best rebounder I've coached since Tyler Hansbrough. Yeah. Right? And Tyler left in 2009. That's quite a while ago. He passed a lot of players. But he can do that. He has a tremendous knack for going after the ball, strong, strong hands that if he gets his hands on the ball, a lot of times it's his as opposed to a, a jump situation. Yeah. And just he, he – uh, I've never played bridge in my life, never. But I heard you bid – that means you will say you want to compete is right. the way I look at it. Well, that's what it is with Dayron. He bids for every missed shot. The 16 rebounds, a freshman season high for Dayron Sharp, and another double-double for him as well mentioned, had the 12 points too. Coach, uh, last thing about this game, then we'll take a break and start getting some questions. Caleb Love had a tough night shooting the ball, 
but he had some nice plays late. He had an assist, a steal, hit a big three for you. Mm-hmm. Hopefully maybe see if we can get his confidence going a little bit. Yeah, that three right in front of our bench was big. I mean, he reacted very emotionally himself because he's just been dying. Yeah. And he shoots the ball in practice very well. I'm telling you, when we have the shooting contest, he's up in the top two or three all the time. But he just hasn't gone in for him during the game. So hopefully that will give him a, another ounce of confidence and a little lift that the next one will go in as well. Carolina again wins it 67-65. Tar Heels supposed to play on Saturday against Clemson. That didn't happen. Instead, they'll be playing Tuesday night in the Smith Center against Syracuse. Again, that's a 9 o'clock start. We'll preview the matchup with the Orange in a little bit. But when Coach and I return, we'll start getting to some of your questions. That's after this on the Roy Williams Show from Learfield IMG College. As always, Coach gets tired of talking to me. That's understandable, but he likes to answer your questions. And so we always ask you to send some in. It is asktheheels at gmail.com is the email address. Or you can send a tweet right to me. It's at Jones Angel, Angel 2Ls at the end. And we always, we have a bunch of questions, but we take our top three every week. And they are presented by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, reminding you to practice your three W's. That is wear, wait, and wash. We resolve to keep North Carolina healthy. Coach, let's start off with Odell sent this one in. And Odell said, based on defensive rebounding stats, it appears that a lot of opponents aren't even trying to go to the offensive glass. Instead, they're immediately falling back on defense to prevent your fast break opportunities. Odell wondered if you felt that way and and how you can try to adjust if you do feel like teams are dropping back. Well, there's no question it's happened my entire coaching career. Uh, Coach Smith and I used to talk about it 100 years ago that we're such a good offensive rebounding team and running the break. All right, so we're going to the boards and you're getting that benefit, but the other teams aren't going to the boards, so you're getting that benefit as well. That helps us with your rebound margin, which I think is extremely important. But the other thing, if they're doing uh, sending people back to start your break, they're not going to the offensive boards themselves. Right. Tim Floyd, one of the great coaches in our game that I ever got to compete against, was coaching at Iowa State, and he sent three guys back. He said he didn't care about not having any offense rebounds. He just didn't want to get killed by our break. And it's reputation now because we're not scoring any on, <laughs> on the break at all. So, Odell, I'm not saying anything because uh, they're, they're getting back trying to stop a break. Heck, we don't even have a fast break right now. So we've got to get a lot better to do both. But our really good teams have had a tremendous advantage scoring points on the break and scoring a tremendous advantage in second shot opportunities. I say this with no facts to back it up, just kind of the way it felt. It felt like in those last couple of minutes of the Miami game that you were able to run a little bit. Like Leakey's three from the sideline, with, I think, in fast break. felt like you got out a little bit. Uh, Jones, I feel like it'd be me on a unicycle. I could keep up, and I've never been on a unicycle in my life. It's just you know, I tell them all the time we don't have a fast break so far this year. We have a slow break. <laughs> Coach Seth Taylor sent this one in, and he said, looks like the team is starting to figure some things out coming together. He was curious what your number one emphasis is right now. He said he knows you're concerned about turnovers, defense, shot selection. Wonders if there's one thing that you're emphasizing with your guys. Well, the, having a passion to play the game every possession, and that uh, if you have that passion, you're not going to say, oh, gosh, I should have gone to the border. I should have sprinted back, or I should have dove on the floor. And that, that passion is the one thing that uh, – uh, passion to compete, passion to give you a better chance to win, passion to out-rebound, out-hustle. And that focus is probably what we're working on more than anything. But he listed himself. I mean, turnovers are killing us. We'd like to shoot the ball in the basket. We'd like to do a lot of other things. But uh, you can, in basketball, you can't just focus on one thing. Right. But the passion to play harder, uh, which Coach Davis and I talked to, even said to the team the other day, he never thought that North Carolina, that we would have to coach effort. Uh, but the last two years, I think we haven't given the effort like all of our other teams have. And the good news is the record is still out on this year's team. We can change, and if we do, we'll be a lot better team. Coach, the third of our three questions presented by Blue Cross and Blue Shield comes from Daniel. Daniel said he's 15 years old, freshman in high school, big Carolina basketball fan, and he has interest into getting into coaching one day. He was wondering if you had any advice on how someone as young as Daniel is could uh, get his foot in the door and how to get started. Well, it's extremely hard. It's it's a, it's a great vocation. It's the greatest thing in the world for me, and I think other people feel that way. I just wanted to be like my high school coach. You've heard me 
say this before, I never knew anything about shoe contracts, radio shows, or anything like that. I just wanted to coach. So you got to have that love to get in that way. If if you're looking for any of the other things, it's it's too difficult. Don't even try it that way. But young kids, young guys that want to get into coaching, if they're still a player, I'd say go to as many basketball camps in the summer as you possibly could because you get different variations and different philosophies of how to play. And you also meet people. Yeah. Uh, I get it a lot from college students, and I sell them to try to work as many of camps as they possibly can. The same thing. They get exposed to different philosophies, and they're able to make some contacts. It's, uh, it's an extremely hard business to get into and to stay in and be successful and not have the problems because there's coaching changes are, are big numbers every every year. But if you truly love that, and I decided when I was in the ninth grade, about that age, uh, probably even a little bit younger, that's what I wanted to do. And I never varied after that the rest of my life. So everything I did was try to become a better basketball player than basketball coach. Good questions, guys. And thank yep. you, Daniel, for that last one. It's our top three questions presented by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina. Again, reminding you to practice your three W's. That's wear, wait, and wash. We resolve to keep North Carolina healthy. We'll be back with Coach Williams on the other side of this commercial break. It's the Roy Williams Show from Learfield IMG College. Thanks again for being with us here on the Roy Williams Show. A couple of reminders of that schedule change, and we'll preview the orange in a moment, but Carolina and Syracuse, that is now 9 o'clock Tuesday night in the Smith Center. We'll be on the air radio-wise for that one at 8 p.m., Carolina's next scheduled game is against Florida State. That is Saturday at noon. Florida State's had some issues, though, here as of late, so keep your ears and eyes open just in case. As we talked about at the top of the show, things are very fluid this season in college basketball, so make sure you uh, make sure you listen in to try to know when the Tar Heels are playing next. All right, let's get to a couple more questions for Coach, and we'll start with Rick. Rick sent this one in. Rick Bryson said, Coach, your sneaker game is getting a lot of attention on social media this season. Are you aware of that? Do you consult the team when it comes to your sneaker fashion game to game? <laughs> uh, it, it, a lot of people are telling me it's getting a lot of attention. And, uh, you know, the ACC coaches every week this summer, and I mean every week, I mean it was like 16, 20 straight weeks. Uh, we visited on the phone every uh, Wednesday, I think it was, at 9 o'clock. And uh, we talked about a lot of things. And one of the things we talked about was a dress code. Right. And everybody wanted to go non-coat, non-tie kind of thing. And I told him a story, but it's very true, that Coach Smith always told me that we, should, if you want to be respected like a businessman, like a professional, that you sh should dress like one. Before he passed away, I never got permission from him to <laughs> not wear. So I've never coached a regular season game other than in Maui or Nassau or something like that, that I didn't wear a coat and tie. I've never worn a turtleneck in a regular game. I think I've worn a turtleneck a couple of exhibition games or something. But that was my feeling. And then, uh, But I told the guys, I said, I've just got to get through that, and I'll be with you in the whole bit. So then I had an original idea, which is unusual for me. I said to Eric Coots, I said, uh, why don't we see if we've got enough of uh, uh, these Jordan shoes and let me wear a different one every game. Yeah. And then they decided to uh, – I guess they put it out in some website or whatever. I don't know what the heck it is. But uh, evidently it's got a lot of attention, and I do. I change them every game. And uh, Eric Hoots and I talk and decide which one to wear. And uh, the team always uh, will usually say something or give me that look or sometimes even more, <laughs> you know, about, Coach, are you sure you're nine and a half, not 13? Uh, but uh, it is something that uh, I've enjoyed it when we've won. That's right. <laughs> and when we haven't won, I haven't enjoyed it at all. So, uh, but it has gotten quite a bit of attention. Very comfortable when you win the game. Yes, Feel great. It is. Yes, it is. <laughs> to that point, Coach, and I, I fumbled the ball. Should have asked this last week. We had the question from John Howes. It was a little more timely then, but I still think a relevant topic. He wanted to know your thoughts on Mike Bray going with the shorts in the, in the Smith Center. Well, what people don't know is that we really could have had a lot of fun at this because Mike <laughs> and I talked. We set the game in literally 10 minutes on right. the phone. We made the decision, yes, let's go with it. And then uh, I sent him a note. Uh, he and I and Paul Brazzo in the charge of basketball in the ACC were cha changing text messages. And I said, Michael, also, I said, uh, uh, this is a personal joke with me and Mike. And, a couple of years ago, they won the Maui Invitational, and he comes in the locker room after the game 
with the ceremonial lay on, but no shirt. <laughs> and I said, uh, so I sent to text Mike, you know, it's going to be 66 degrees here in uh, Chapel Hill on game time. And uh, we just want to know if you're going to wear a shirt. And we, he got a laugh out of it, so did Brazo. And then Mike sends a text back, hey, babe, first game ever in shorts. And I told him in the pregame conference that we had for 30 seconds with our mask on and everything, I said, I knew you were going to do that when you said it. And I said, I came so close to wearing a three-piece suit, coat, and tie, just so they could know how different we were. He said, oh, gosh, I wish you had done that. Just think of what the picture would have looked like. Uh, but I gave in to just going back the way we were regularly doing. But uh, as soon as he came walking out, I said, I should have gone ahead and done the three-piece suit. He seems like a fun guy, Mike He's Bray. a good guy. He's a big-time coach, but he's a good guy. He's fun to be with. He's straightforward. It's, there's no motive that he's trying to hide from you. It's a guy that I really enjoy. Coach, one more here. It comes from Alex Gilmore. Alex wondered how the lack of meaningful crowd noise this year, has that changed the way that you communicate with your team on the court? Do you have to call plays differently in any any way, or has it changed the way you talk with your team? Well, you know, it, it hasn't affected my coaching. You know, I still wear a mask, and I right. wear it 99.9 tenths of the time. Some coaches pull it down to talk, but – I've got such a big mouth and a voice that they can hear. It's uh, uh, it's easier to get messages to them and communicate with them without the crowd there. The toughest spot was at Georgia Tech because they had their pet band there right on our end of the court, and we yep. couldn't hear a blessed thing in the huddle. And so that was the most difficult one. But uh, uh, it has not been a problem. Um, I w- would love the fans to be there because I still say every player, former player, they always tell me, I'd love to run through that tunnel one more time because mm-hmm. the noise that you hear when you come out on that court as a Carolina basketball player and the noise that you hear when the crowd's trying to help you get a defensive stop is something that I do really miss. And just in talking to a couple of the guys, they've talked about that, about how it is difficult both at home and on the road, mm-hmm. that, that you don't have that aspect to it, kind of part of what you want to enjoy in college basketball, but they understand, obviously, it's the situation we're in, and it's yeah. affecting everyone, not just them. Yeah. Um, one of those guys, Coach, is Kerwin Walton, going to play some of an interview. Adam Lucas and I had a chance to catch up with Kerwin. Uh, we'll run that interview after this next break, but uh, just a really fun young guy and somebody who's really doing a nice job on the court for you here in the last couple of games. He's getting better and better, and he's uh, been challenged by me specifically to get better on the defensive end of the floor. He's trying. He's getting a little bit better and a little bit better. But he can really shoot the ball, yeah. and it's a it's a big hole in our game and I, our team. And I told him when we recruited him, you've got a chance to come play as a freshman. You got to be tough enough to make shots, uh, and you got to get better defensively. But he's a a great kid. His two biggest problems is so quiet. Yeah. It's hard for him to be vocal out on the court. And as a defensive player, you have to be vocal. And then the other thing is that everybody's just thinking about him shooting the ball. So he's getting a lot of attention. But they're running people at him, and that opens up some other people as well. Uh, But if he'll just keep getting a little bit better and a little bit better defensively, then I don't have to worry about do I take him out. Is that the five best defensive players I want in the game? And that was the last play at Miami. Are those the five best defensive players we want on the court? So everybody that uh, is a good shooter should make darn sure that they're going to be in that top five defensively too. So you'll hear some of that conversation with Kerwin coming up after this break. Coach will rejoin us in the final segment to preview the matchup with Syracuse. That's on the Roy Williams Show from Learfield IMG College. So Carolina hosting Syracuse tomorrow night, 9 o'clock in at the Smith Center, rescheduled game. And Coach mentioned this earlier, Syracuse hasn't played a ton, 7-2 and two overall, but Coach, they've only played twice since December 19th, so another team that has been affected heavily with this unusual schedule that we're all dealing well, with. Well, they have been affected a great deal, and you feel for them, feel for the kids. I'm not going to feel for them tomorrow night. I hope <laughs> they have all kinds of problems how they're playing, but uh, it is the world that we're in. The zone is a major uh, challenge for us last year. Perhaps our best game of the year was at Syracuse, and perhaps our worst game of the year was less than a week and a half later uh, playing Syracuse in the second round of the ACC tournament. So uh, we've got to move ourselves and move the ball, do it intelligently, try to get the ball where we want to go, not take uh, the first quick shot, and not turn the ball over. Their defense, even though it's zone, it's an active zone. They get a lot of steals, and it's a a defense that is really hard 
to prepare for. It's a defense really hard to play against. Uh, it's hard to run the ball at them. They're they're a good team, and Jimmy Bayheim's one of our great coaches. Now Syracuse forcing 17 turnovers per game to back up what Coach was saying about how aggressive they are defensively. Last thing, Coach, you, you do think about the zone immediately when you think about Syracuse. They're they're averaging 80 points a game. They they have five guys averaging better than 11 and a half points per contest. Well, they're they've never been a slow down team on the offensive end. Their defense slows you down because it's a zone. You don't get as many quick shots, and it's hard to run but they have never been a, a slow paced team on the offensive end and they're shooting and making mm-hmm. a lot of threes and threes add up a little faster than twos uh but no it's it's not going to be a uh slow down game by any means we're going to try to run and they try to take advantage of bad shots and turnovers against that zone and go to the other end again that's a nine o'clock game to uh tomorrow night in the smith center tuesday night in chapel hill nine o'clock we're on the air radio wise at 8 p.m coach great to be with you again as always thanks for your time and we'll see you next week okay jones have a great day and let's hope it's a great night tuesday night